Okay, thank you. Uh, let me start by thanking the organizers for the opportunity to give a talk here. Uh, this will just be an overview of some results that we've obtained over the last uh, two or three years, basically, in the context of this kind of larger program. Um, and since this is a more mixed audience, I don't really want to go into too much technical detail. Of course, you can ask me about it, but I, I want to focus more on the general ideas, uh, also from the conceptual side. So the idea is basically already in the title, uh, we're working in a basically a discrete setting for quantum gravity where we can uh, uh, think of geometry as kind of uh, composed of uh, discrete applications which we can picture as some kind of atoms uh, if we want. And then the idea, the proposal here is basically that the universe should be some kind of condensate of a very large number of these uh, discrete, of, uh, discrete degrees of freedom that are in some kind of um, coherent uh, macroscopic configuration and the goal is then to um, um, to derive some kind of effective uh, quantum cosmology uh, um, dynamics uh, more or less directly from a proposal for fundamental uh, quantum gravity. So this is a work that we've uh, started with uh, Daniele Orisi and Lorenzo Sindoni in these two papers basically and there's some more follow-up uh, work since then. So here's an uh, outline of my talk. I will uh, spend some time uh, on the introduction and motivation of this approach, also comparing it to uh, what has been before in this uh, more general uh, setting of uh, the connection of technology and quantum. Um, then, more specifically, of course, we need to have um, a, a concrete uh, theory, a concrete framework in which we can actually uh, do calculations. So this is the setting of group field theory, which uh, I think is not really familiar to most people. Um, so I will uh, describe that very briefly as a potential uh, framework for uh, discrete quantum gravity. It's very closely related to loop quantum gravity in a way that I will also make clear. And then I will show um, how to define uh, these, these condensates. Uh, we are basically um, using uh, intuition and also some uh, mathematical language basically from uh, condensed matter physics, where you actually have a condensate in the lab of, um, of atoms. Um, and so much of the um, intuition here will basically be uh, by analogy with condensed matter physics. So hopefully this will become a bit clearer. Uh, but we will apply this then to the uh, setting of, uh, of quantum gravity. And I will show how and uh, how you can actually um, do calculations with these condensates. And then the main goal is basically in this part is to extract some kind of effective uh, cosmological uh, dynamics, so something like a quantum cosmology model uh, from the proposed dynamics of the of the fundamental degrees of freedom of uh, of, of quantum gravity. Um, and then I will have a summary and outlook at the end. So. Um, I think there has been a lot of interest, especially in recent years, in the interplay between uh, theories of quantum gravity and, and early universe uh, cosmology. And I think the interest is really works both ways. So um, if you're working on quantum gravity, of course, one day you have to be able to come up with some kind of observational test of your theory. And uh, I would claim that the, the very, very early universe because um, the, the energy scales become high enough for some kind of effects of quantum gravity to be, to be potentially at least relevant. Um, so this is the, the interest of quantum gravity people to say something about cosmology. Um, I think also on the other hand, uh, there can be some uh, input from quantum gravity that can be helpful for cosmology. So in, in, in standard theoretical cosmology, we know that there is still a Big Bang singularity, which we have to resolve uh, at some point, so we have to understand how that works, and we would most naturally turn to a quantum theory for that. Um, more specifically, if you're interested in inflation, there are many theoretical issues that people debate a lot, like uh, the choice of initial conditions, um, the precise shape and form of the uh, potential for inflation, and fine-tuning issues, and so on. And then you might have the hope, at least, that uh, some input from quantum gravity could help you in uh, constraining these, these things a bit more. So then if you're uh, a quantum gravity person, what you should do 
uh, in your in your favorite theory, whatever it is, you should be able to describe um, a universe that's um, relevant for cosmology. So it should be something like a um, almost homogeneous and isotropic uh, universe with perturbations, and in particular also time dependent. And you should also, and this is perhaps the even harder part, you should be able to compute some kind of effective uh, dynamics for these universes from your theory that you can then compare with, uh, for example, the predictions of other cosmological scenarios, and of course, at the end of the day, also with observation. And I would say that this is, in general, a very hard problem. So we basically have one, one proposal towards this. Um, a bit of history here. Um, so since this is very hard, what people have done uh, historically and traditionally uh, in quantum cosmology is to work in the mini superspace truncation, starting from Misner and Wheeler, DeWitt, many others, of course, um, where basically you assume at the classical level uh, an exactly homogeneous uh, continuum uh, metric uh, perhaps isotropic, perhaps anisotropic, but you are left with uh, only a finite number of degrees of freedom for geometry, which you are then quantizing, and you're developing some kind of quantum theory of these remaining degrees of freedom, which are only the exactly homogeneous mode of geometry, basically. So you can do that and then uh, do calculations and so on, and, and this has been followed, of course, by many people over the years. Um, conceptually, you don't really know very much about what this really has to do with the full theory of quantum gravity because you've removed so much of the degrees of freedom already at the classical level. Um, so some progress was made uh, starting from the, from the work of, of Martin Boyerwald um, by uh, using uh, some input from quantum gravity, basically uh, loop quantum gravity uh, methods in the quantization, but still in this mini superspace context, so still a finite dimensional a quantum mechanical model, but with a different kind of quantum theory, uh, which leads to loop quantum cosmology, um, which has been again been followed by by many people, and there's a lot of results, and we'll hear about it from Aurelien uh, later uh, this week. And um, there's one uh, thing that happens right in the beginning: you can show that the Big Bang singularity is now replaced by a bound. So this is very nice. The singularity is removed, um, and you can do a lot of more things, of course. But again, the connection to the full theory is kind of unclear. And I would say there's no clear way in which you can identify these exactly homogeneous metrics that you have quantized with states in the full theory of loop quantum gravity. And there's a lot of ongoing work by many people, but I would stay, say this is still um, not resolved in, in full. So um, one viewpoint that you can take on this issue, which is um, I'm taking this from a recent uh, review by, by Martin Boyerwald, um, is to say that if you uh, study a mini superspace model in quantum cosmology, you can view this as a kind of quantum theory of a single patch of the universe. So you're looking at a very small, something like an elementary patch of geometry, which is homogeneous in itself, and you're quantizing that, and um, you might call this an atom of space, um, and then you're studying the quantum theory of that, um, and assuming that the universe is exactly homogeneous, you might think that the, the model you've developed in this way could be a good approximation to what really is the full dynamics of a large number of these patches. So um, more generally, you can imagine very inhomogeneous configurations, but you're kind of assuming that your configuration is sufficiently homogeneous that you can only focus on one of these atoms. Um, and it's then also clear that this is may or may not be a good strategy. You can think of examples where this works and examples where this really doesn't work very well. Sorry? So this is a canonical setting. So you have some kind of Wheeler-DeWitt equation, Hamiltonian constraint. And yeah. Yeah, you live with the problem of time, absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm completely skipping over all the conceptual difficulties with this kind of quantum cosmology. I'll get to that at the end, I think, a bit, but not very much. Um, so yeah, if you then take this viewpoint of this, of this single patch model, there's a, a natural uh, um, strategy in order to go beyond this mini superspace truncation, which is that you should really study some kind of many patch model. So you uh, take a, not just a single patch, you take a large number of degrees of freedom of uh, quantum geometry, potentially infinite, and you uh, study 
this kind of interacting quantum system. Of course, in general, this will look not, not, nothing like our own universe. Uh, in order to look like our universe, these many degrees of freedom should be in some kind of particularly nice symmetric configuration. And if you then think about um, a condensate in condensed matter physics, this is basically uh, what you would like to kind of imitate uh, to some extent. So it's then kind of natural to think of some kind of coherent state, um, some kind of macroscopic uh, configuration of a very large number of, of these atoms of space and some kind of condensate. Um, and so this is the idea that I'll be exploring in the rest of the talk. And uh, more concretely, I'm working in the setting of group field theory, as I mentioned, um, which I will show uh, in, a, in a minute. But what we can basically do then in this, in this setting uh, is at least these, these three things uh, that I'm listing here. So the first thing was basically what I discussed already, deriving some kind of effective cosmological dynamics from quantum gravity. Um, there are many issues that have been discussed also over the years in, in the literature in loop quantum gravity. Um, the meaning of the continuum limit or breaking or deformation of symmetries and so on, which you can study in these models because they are rich enough, because they have uh, already a large number of degrees of freedom and all these issues are completely absent in uh, mini superspace because there you just don't have enough degrees of freedom. And then uh, also very importantly, if we want to connect to observation, we also need a framework that's ri rich enough to include cosmological inhomogeneities. So I will come to that uh, towards the end. Um, so yeah, um, I should talk a bit about what group field theory is at this stage. So basically, uh, in, in, in one sentence, you could say that group field theory gives you a, a quantum field theory language for simplicial geometry, which is a certain type of discrete geometry. And it's also one way of defining the kinematics and the dynamics of loop quantum gravity. Um, you can also come from a different direction and view it as a generalization of matrix models and tensor models um, in, in a way that I'll make clear in a, in a moment. So um, what you have, at least in the formulation that we're using here, is basically a complex scalar field. So a standard quantum field theory of a, of a scalar field, um, which is uh, defined, which kind of is a function on this uh, quotient space here. So G is some Lie group that you, that you fix for the model. And you take four copies of the Lie group. Um, and you have this kind of quotient space where you kind of have this uh, group action on the right on, this, uh, on these four copies. And what I mean by that is basically a diagonal action. So um, you can think of this field as um, a function of four copies of the group G, which has this invariance that it's uh, invariant if you multiply all these elements uh, all these arguments from the right by the same group element. And uh, G itself is chosen in such a way that it basically represents the local gauge group of gravity. So you think of a, a, a theory of gravity in terms of some spin connection, and that gives you a notion of local gauge symmetry, and that's uh, implemented by this choice of G. So in four dimensions, you would typically choose SL2C, the Lorentz group, or you would take a, a rotation group in four dimensions, or if you want to do basically Ashtika variables, you can choose SU2. And um, the, the interpretation of these group elements is basically um, the variables, it's, it's very similar to the variables of lattice gauge theory, so these are basically finite parallel transports of the gravitational connection that you associate to, um, to four links um, that basically um, are associated to the elementary excitations of the of the um, quantum field. So um, um, basically, you, you because you have a quantum field, you can picture the excitations as some kind of particles. And in this uh, simplicial geometry language, they're tetrahedra because these are the elementary building blocks of, of geometry. And you can then associate um, these uh, group elements to kind of four links that go through the four faces of this tetrahedron that give you some notion of parallel transports. Um, so that's where these group elements come from. So it's, it's important to keep in mind that this space has nothing to do with uh, space-time or physical space, but it's more like this auxiliary space of, uh, of connection degrees of freedom that we're associating to the, 
to the excitations. In this sense, it's also generalization of a matrix model or a tensor model where you would just have uh, indices here instead of these arguments that actually take values in a continuous uh, group. Okay, uh, you can make all this uh, more concrete in a, in a canonical formalism that we're using here, which is very similar to or closely related to the Hilbert space structure of loop quantum gravity. So you start with some kind of uh, Fock vacuum. So this is completely standard Fock representation of a scalar field theory. So you start with this Fock vacuum. And the meaning of the Fock vacuum in, uh, in loop quantum gravity would be the Ashtika Lewandowski vacuum. It's often referred to as the no space vacuum. So it's a completely de degenerate geometry. Um, you can think of it as basically zero metric if you want, uh, loosely speaking. So there's no excitations of geometry. Um, in, this, in this vacuum, uh, mathematically, it's defined by being uh, annihilated by this uh, field operator. And then you impose these uh, kind of standard non-relativistic uh, commutation relations. Um, so here, I'm just, I just have to make sure I can't just put a delta here because this has to be um, compatible with this invariance of the, of the field under the right action of the group. So it's some kind of group average delta. But you can kind of ignore that. Um, so these are the commutation relations that you impose. And what this means is that you can basically think of uh, phi as a superposition of annihilation operators and phi dagger as a superposition of creation operators. And so then when you act on the vacuum with phi dagger, you basically get this, which is the tetrahedron that I just mentioned. It's basically your atom of space or your elementary particle, if you want, in this kind of Fox space. And here I'm, uh, I'm uh, labeling all these links with group elements, as I said before. And if you know about loop quantum gravity, this is an open spin network vertex, which is four-valent. And then you can, uh, you, know, you can keep going and act with, with phi dagger to create more and more particles. And you get a standard bosonic Fox space of um, discrete geometries that are basically um, made up of kind of stuff that we're using here. And uh, the proposal is now to think of some kind of condensate of a very large number of these degrees of freedom. There are many different ways in which you can do that. So there's a pretty large uh, freedom in defining this state. Uh, what I'm presenting here is just the very simplest choice that basically in the, you know, if you go into a, a textbook on, on Bose-Einstein condensate, Um, that's, a, that's a good point. Um, well, these are chunks of geometry. I find it hard to think of them as fermionic. <laughs> so I want them to be... It could be exotic... I think people have studied these models also with exotic statistics, so there's literature. So there's, this is basically the simplest choice. So I don't think it's really, really fixed. That's right. That's right. But I'm imposing these at this stage without any good external motivation. So that, yeah, that's right. Um, uh, yeah, so what we're looking for is some kind of coherent state, some kind of generalized coherent state, which uh, represents a condensate. So um, in, in analogy with what happens in, in standard field theory, what this means is that the field operator acquires some kind of non-zero expectation value, unlike the vacuum, the Fock vacuum, and it should have a very large particle number with respect to the Fock vacuum in order to be representing a kind of potentially continuum phase away from the, from the Fock vacuum. Um, so this is basically the simplest state of the sort that you can think of. So this is exactly the, the kind of state you would look at um, in the simplest uh, case in condensed matter physics. So here you take the, um, the, the, the field operator, which is basically a creation operator. You introduce this function sigma which is, um, plays the role of a mean field. It's basically the expectation value of the field operator. And here you take the exponential. So this is, you can see directly that this is an eigenstate of phi. Um, so if, we, if you act with phi, you just get sigma. So that's the expectation value of the field. And the particle number is just the integral over the modulus of sigma squared. So this can be as large as you want, basically. Um, and you can picture this as some kind of gas of weakly interacting atoms of space. Um, 
as I said before, this is just the simplest construction you can, you can make, and it's kind of very naive because it ignores correlations between these, um, between these building blocks. And uh, in fact, you can construct more, more interesting, more complicated states, and you can also include um, excitations over the condensate, as you would do in, in uh, condensed matter physics. Um, but uh, um, how much time do I have? 10 minutes or something? OK. So that's good. I just want to talk a bit more about um, how we now use this proposal. So, so far, this is just an idea. I'm just writing down a state in this kind of discrete quantum gravity model. And of course, there's some intuition behind it that the state uh, may represent a reasonably good approximation to something that's physically interesting. But now I want to use this proposal to actually extract some information about the dynamics um, and, and actually connect to, to cosmology. So um, I don't want to go into too much detail, but just explain in general terms what we're doing. So um, of course, a, a GFT model that you take from the literature is specified by some action, so it's some functional of the field and of the complex conjugate. And um, you can then uh, derive formally these kind of general uh, Schwinger-Dyson equations, um, which basically give you expectation values or are expressed in terms of expectation values, where O is some observable, so some functional, basically, that you, that you fix. Um, and um, this basically gives you some relations between the endpoint functions of your, of your theory. So this is completely general. And depending on what you actually choose here and um, you know, how complicated you choose these, these observables, you get um, relations between uh, higher and higher endpoint functions, basically. So again, if you want to connect this to condensed matter physics, you can just take the simplest case in which uh, this is just one, and then um, this would give you the gross bitter um, which again is the simplest approximation to the dynamics. Um, and um, if you want to go further, you take uh, more and more of these uh, higher uh, uh, relations into account, but then you stop at some point, and this is basically your truncation of the dynamics of the theory because you're only focusing on these expectation values. Um, what you get in practice is some kind of complicated, in general, some kind of complicated nonlinear, nonlocal differential equations for sigma, which is this mean field. So what I mean here by this uh, subscript is that I've already chosen this particular state, for example, or this class of states, if, if you want. And basically, the free parameters are given just by this, by this function. So what I have to uh, constrain through dynamics is this choice of, of function. Um, so then you get these equations for this mean field, and you still want to connect this to cosmology. So, so how do you do that? The point is that you can now um, compute the values of certain operators, observables, on this, on this quantum geometric uh, Fox space. Um, so the simplest one, for example, you can think of is something like the total volume. You can just associate to any collection of these um, degrees of freedom. You can just uh, uh, compute the total volume, the expectation value. And then you could say, oh, if I'm in a homogeneous isotropic configuration, that should be proportional to the scale factor cubed um, in terms of cosmology. So that gives me a notion of scale factor. Right? The total volume can change over time and associate that with the scale factor. Um, similarly, I can derive something that basically measures curvature, and I can associate that with the Hubble parameter, and so on. Um, so that's how, I'm, how I can associate cosmological quantities to this kind of uh, condensate. But there are also things like the particle number, right? I can just count the number of, of atoms, and this, of course, has no direct classical analog in, in GR. But these quantities also exist in the theory, of course, and are very important. And what I then get is basically, from these equations, I get some kind of constraints between these expectation values. Um, so what I get is um, constraints between quantities like the scale factor and the expansion rate, or the matter density, if I had matter in the model. And of course, if I'm in isotropic homogeneous uh, um, universes, this would just be something like a Friedman equation. More generally, it's some kind of effective Hamiltonian constraint. So in a way, basically, we're working backwards. We know what the quantum dynamics is, or at least we have a proposal, and we are, we are um, trying to derive some kind of effective approximation in this condensate um, regime, basically, where this is a good approximation to a physical state. Um, 
the, the point I want to make here is that there are interesting effects, direct effects of discreteness. So these kind of effective Friedman equations uh, depend in general also on the quantum numbers, for example, the number of atoms in the condensate. So I'm just giving one example here to illustrate this. So this is in a specific model and for a specific choice of state and so on. So maybe not to be taken too seriously, but just to illustrate the structure that we obtain. So what you see here, so the, the variables are basically the scale factor. This is a connection. Uh, here you have the Planck length. N is the number of, uh, of atoms. Um, and this mu is also a function of the number of atoms. So it's basically scales like n to the minus one third. The first thing you find is that instead of the connection, you always get the sign of the connection together with this function here. Um, and this is very, very well known from loop quantum cosmology. These are basically the holonomy corrections that occur because you don't have the connection, but only these finite parallel transports. Um, but what's nice, I have this. First it was Um, that's um, another point I just wanted to make uh, about inhomogeneities. So if you think about normal mini superspace models, you have a wave function of the universe, and that defines by construction, basically, quantum mechanics of a single universe, which is perfectly homogeneous. Here we have a very different picture, because we have this mean field approximation for the condensate. So we get this mean field, which we've called sigma here, and it looks like a, a wave function in, to some extent. It's often called the condensate wave function, actually, in the condensed matter context. But in fact, this is more like, because you've already taken an expectation value, um, this is more like a hydrodynamic approximation in which you think of some kind of fluid. So here, what you get is some kind of fluid on mini superspace. So you don't have a, a wave function for mini superspace, but you have some kind of fluid. So you have a probability distribution for many kind of patches, kind of elementary um, uh, degrees of freedom that have a particular shape and the ability to space. What you're looking for in cosmology because you can directly translate this classical statistical distribution, which is what you see in the sky. Um, so in, in principle, um, capturing some, some this, and that's basically because we're already exciting an infinite number of degrees of freedom of, of quantum geometry instead of just the one homogeneous mode. Okay, I should probably come to the end. So here I just wanted to, I can be very brief here, I just wanted to be a bit more speculative. So one exciting scenario that's a possibility here is this idea of geometrogenesis, which is basically um, associated with phase transitions. So um, again, what happens in condensed physics that you start with nice gas, and then at some point when you tune your couplings, you encounter a phase. Here, I kind of expect a phase transition between this nice geometry. Can't be described by a smooth geometry at all. So um, the, the point I want to make here is that these condensates of atoms of space in group field theory are um, our proposal for describing a macroscopic cosmological universe in discrete quantum gravity. I only talked about the simplest approximation. 
in which you take this coherent state of many atoms, which are all in some kind of common ground state. Um, you can then look at this hydrodynamic approximation of the, of the quantum dynamics to extract some kind of effective cosmological dynamics. And the conceptual picture here is that the universe is some kind of fluid or mini superspace. Um, and um, I showed, in, at least in one example, how we can compute uh, generalized Friedman equations uh, from expectation values of, of observables in this, in this field theory. And um, nice and very generic consequences um, come from fundamental discreteness. And these are, will have a direct impact on the, on the uh, phenomenology. Of course, there are many open questions. We have to make sure that this uh, whole scenario is consistent with GR or some form of higher derivative theory, at least in some regime where it's well enough tested. Um, we have to understand the stability of the approximations that we've made and where they break down. Related to that, the fate of the singularity, it should really be related to some kind of phase transition here, which has to be understood much better. And I think this is what, what Daniela will talk about uh, later this week. We should really compute the spectrum of cosmological perturbations for some interesting models so that we can actually talk about relation to observations. And we need to understand much better how to incorporate matter fields and also talk about the cosmological constant, and of course there's much more that we have to do. So thanks for your attention. Well, it's, it's supposed to be related to full gravity, so it, it, it comes... That's right. Well, that's right. So this maybe I should have stressed this, this more. So what I'm focusing on here is just the very simplest case in which I'm assuming the condensate to describe an almost exactly homogeneous and isotropic universe. This is a very specific choice of configuration. Of course, a generic state in this theory looks nothing like a homogeneous or isotropic universe, and then I can't talk about a Friedman equation. Well, there is a, well, you can think of, I mean, this is a field theory, so you can think about the classical field theory, but what it means is not very well understood. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's basically part of the motivation of this work, that, you know, we have a complicated quantum theory of interacting degrees of freedom at the Planck scale, basically, and we want to look at some, you know, effective large-scale physics. Here in the setting of cosmology, which you can think of as basically a highly simplified uh, setting, of you know what could be more potentially uh, potentially more general universes, but we're starting with the simplest ones, which are interesting, which are basically FRW universes. But this, in general, should be much more general. If this makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the most important ingredient here is this additional equation of state, basically, this relation of the, between the number of atoms and the scale factor, which is basically what you would compute in LQC through the lattice refinement procedure. So um, we don't really have a systematic way of computing that yet from the, from the full theory, so we kind of have to put it in by hand, in, in, in which case you can reproduce existing models of LQC, but this really depends to a large extent on what exactly you choose. So it's a bit... Um, I think we should talk about what you mean. <laughs> Which equation exactly? But So what we first did was kind of just to ignore these terms and then choose a specific matter coupling. And then you reproduce exactly the simplest LQC improved dynamics models. But this is with a lot of assumptions, so these should be refined much more. Mm -hmm. This one? Yeah, that's the imaginary unit, so, right. So this is, yeah, that's right. So 
um, I kind of wanted to skip over this, I guess. So in these, when you take these expectation values, typically they can be complex. So the kind of, um, you know, in this hydrodynamic approximation, the kind of coarse grain kind of macroscopic observables you define, in general, are not Hermitian. So they can take complex uh, eigenvalues. Um, well, at this stage, this is to some extent um, not very well understood, but it's very, it's fairly common in quantum cosmology, even in the old kind of uh, Hawking approach, that saddle points, for example, to the path integral are typically complex, right? You have these, um, well, it's, yeah, well, you start with Euclidean, but then the, all the effective geometries you look at as saddle points are typically complex. So they're, they can have real sections, which are Lorentzian or Euclidean, but typically they're complex. So this is fairly, I would say this is not too surprising in quantum cosmology if you're looking at some kind of approximation. Um, what it means in more detail? 